Hello, everybody. Good morning. So, as I said, it's great to see you. And Sundays, Sundays are hugely important for us here. Um, we gather as a, as a family of God's people. Now, we've had busy weeks. We've been running this way and that way. And, uh, and it's important for us to draw aside. Remember when Jesus said to his disciples, Come ye apart and rest a while. Now, there's a wonderful Christian retreat center uh, in the Machalisberg up in Gauteng called Kayara. Kayara. C Y A R A. Kayara. It's a lovely name. But what does that actually represent? It's, it's the first letters of those words that Jesus spoke. Come, see, ye, why, apart, a, and rest, a, a while. Come ye apart and rest a while. Which if you take those words, letters, form that lovely name, Kayara. And I like to think this is an opportunity when we come apart, all that we've been doing, perhaps some noise in our heads and things that we're wrestling with, the week coming up, we're trying to get perspective on everything, and Jesus says, come apart, come apart. Begin to just turn your eyes on me, and see things from a different point of view. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Because, you know, we don't just come here to listen to a sermon or sing a few happy songs. We come here to spend this time very pointedly and specifically with our Lord. Yes, of course, we can meet him all over the place, and he is there. But this is different. This is different. We speak, in my own particular spiritual background, of, and many churches do, of the very real, the, the real presence, the real presence of our Lord. And I want us to be aware of the real presence of God amongst us. And wherever you may find yourself today, whatever it is you're thinking about, whatever the issues you're grappling with, just to be still and know that Jesus has invited you just to come apart because he wants to speak to us. He really does. So remember that Jesus was an historical figure, lived long ago. And yes, some will respect him because he is a great spiritual and religious leader of, of yesteryear. But that's not all. He was amongst us as a man. And he performed extraordinary things. But even that is not why we worship him, because he performed miracles. He died. And that was a puzzle to the people who knew and loved him. They didn't understand that. Why should such a good man as Jesus die in such a violent and horrible way? And then the game changer. He rose again from the dead. And in rising from the dead, the church has proclaimed that Jesus is Lord. Truly, the Lord, never more to die, the one who has conquered death, the one who has conquered sin and evil, the one who is amongst us today. That separates him from all the previous and even impressive religious leaders. The fact that Jesus is alive, the Son of God, that is why we sing Jesus' name above all names. And he doesn't just stand afar as the Lord like we must now acclaim some distant remote figure, but he comes near. 
He speaks to us. He knows us by name. And our gathering here is a time of fellowship and time of worship of Jesus. And so we're going to read a passage this morning which underlines um, just how Jesus was caught up in, in issues um, and experienced life in, in, in all its profundities and in all its challenges. We're going to read about the temptations of Jesus, which underline that he was like us, that he experienced life in all its dimensions. Yes, there were times when, when he was especially close to his heavenly Father. There were times when he struggled. And when we find him in the wilderness early on in the Gospel of Matthew, we find Jesus wrestling, struggling. We speak about the temptations of Jesus. Some of us imagine that Jesus kind of found it all rather easy. That when confronted by these things, it was so much easier for him because he was, after all, the Son of God. But these temptations are real. I remember in my university days, we used to discuss whether Jesus was not able to sin or able not to sin. You see the difference there? Was Jesus able to sin or was he able not to sin? I like to think that he was able not to sin, that the capacity there was there to have made a wrong choice. That it was real, it was a struggle. Otherwise, these temptations I don't connect with. Jesus was confronted by a real challenge by Satan. And it was difficult. What do I do here? So we're going to read the stories. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, the way I read it, it's kind of, you know, Satan said this, and Jesus said that. Kind of, I should be putting a little bit more of myself into this. Forty days, he has not eaten. He is weak. He's probably, his mind is is playing tricks on him. He is weak. So, in a way, I read it in the wrong way when I said, you know, Satan said, Jesus answered, you know, and they had this little dialogue, and he said, oh, please, you know, kind of go away. No, there's a sense of agony here. If, if, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And you can almost imagine Jesus out there, kind of, you know, 40 days. I go one day without a meal, or skip lunch, and I'm struggling come evening. 40 days, 40 days. Now, you can't live without, without water for 40 days. And Jesus knew the wilderness, and probably he knew a little, little, little oasis or a little stream or something hidden behind a rock where he could get some water. But the food, no. And after 40 days, he's physically, emotionally, spiritually drained. Soon after I got here in 2000, I bumped into a friend of mine who was visiting Hermanus. I knew him from Zimbabwe, and he was emaciated, emaciated. I said, David, what is the matter? Thinking that probably he was in the last stages of cancer or something. He said, James, I'm on a 40-day fast. I said, excuse me? I'm a 40-day pass. And I said, well, what day are you? <laughs> you know, he was about day 25. I just said, David, go carefully, but go carefully. But I was appalled at his, his appearance. 
he felt that that's what he was needing to do because uh, he needed, you know, he'd been a Rhodesian or Zimbabwean farmer. He'd lost his farm and it was a big crisis and he needed to, to sort out in his mind through prayer and fasting about his future. Um, so, so Jesus is in a, is in a, in a low place, a really, really low place. And at the end of that, then Satan strikes. And he says, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And probably as a kid, you know, he saw his mom, Mary, baking bread. Turn these stones into bread. And he has maybe, you know, I like to think of his mind playing tricks and he pictures himself as a child running through the house because Mary, his mom, had baked some bread and he was a kid and he liked nothing more than hot bread. Come on, we all like hot bread. And this is all there. 40 days he hasn't eaten. And Jesus is in this place and he says, it, it is written Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. Now probably again here, it's in his mind, and he is there standing at, the, at that high point in Jerusalem. If you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down, for goodness sake. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Sometimes, you know, all you've got is scripture when you're weak. You know, when I was walking up Kilimanjaro some years ago, and I, I had committed to pray for, for some people. Um, in fact, the whole congregation, but I had a list there. And, and as you, the higher you go and the air gets thinner, and, and rational thought kind of can often sort of move away from you, all I was left with was... The Jesus prayer, the Jesus prayer, you know, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. Because mentally I was not able to say, you know, Lord, now I'm going to pray for so-and-so and please watch over them. And now, Lord, I'm going to think of so-and-so. I couldn't. Just it was a, a sort of a prayer that I'd learned that had become very much part of my prayer life, the Jesus prayer. And I prayed that. I just prayed that. And yes, you may say, yeah, but does God listen to the rote prayers? Believe me, on Kilimanjaro, God listens to every prayer. And, and every prayer was prayed earnestly, even though I just knew it off by heart, knew it off by heart. It was a whole lot easier than sort of thinking, now, you know, I pray for David and Pauline and their, you know, their church in Cannes and all that. No, couldn't do that. And Jesus just has these scriptures. He, he's probably so weak, but he just, at that moment, a scripture comes to him, and the word of God is powerful. It's like a two-edged sword, and Jesus takes on Satan in his own weakness through this, this scripture that is there. Do not, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Similarly, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Try and get scripture into your heart and your head. It is just such a strengthening element in our faith. And then, and then, that's the, 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 the temptations are not over. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. You know, probably standing there in the wilderness, looking out over I mean, Kilimanjaro, highest point in Africa, 
nothing I've seen so spectacular. You stand there at Uhuru Point and look over Africa, as it were, for miles and miles and miles. I'm sure I could see Hermanus from <laughs> Kilimanjaro, you know. Way noch dar in die Ferte, you know. Um, and Jesus there, and, and, and he's in this high point, and he, as far as the eye can see, just mountains and hills, and Satan says, you know, you can have all this. It can all be yours. Why go the way of the cross? Let's have a shortcut. It's easy. Just bow down and worship me. Acknowledge me. Now, was that a struggle or was it not? Well, it's a temptation. It has to be a struggle. You think, well, surely Jesus wouldn't even think twice about it. But he was vulnerable. He was vulnerable. And then how does he fight back in his utter weakness? It is written. You know, away from me. You know, away from me, Satan. Go to hell. Yeah. Away from me. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. Now those are real. Those are real. And they're all quite subtle. Then there's a sort of a bit of an ambiguity about it. There's an ambiguity about it. You know, bread. Why, why? If Jesus could make bread and he is, after all, the Son of God, why, why couldn't he turn those stones? And he could, but why didn't he? Um, and it was a very real, real thing. I think it was a symbolic temptation and... and the real temptation is, why have you come to this world? Are you going to just be a popular figure who's feeding the hungry and they're meeting everybody's spiritual, at least physical needs? Uh, and Jesus has to decide, why is here? Yes, people are hungry. And yes, feeding the hungry was part of Jesus' ministry. It was. Don't get me wrong. He fed the 5,000. But that's not his primary reason. Jesus' fundamental mission, I guess, was spiritual. He wanted people to begin to know God and understand a little about who God is and love God. And you don't necessarily do that by just dishing out food from one week to the next, as important as feeding the hungry may be. Jesus wants us to know God, his heavenly Father. And we can, we're spiritual beings, we have profound spiritual needs. And these needs, this sense of spirit is something that connects us to God and and Jesus said, I have come to restore people in their relationship with God as the foundation of everything. I'm not going to put the cart before the horse. They're going to know their God. They're going to know their God as the basis of everything. Man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So never forget that you're a spiritual being as well. You are. And you can satisfy every physical need and yet feel empty. Empty. That, I guess, is one of the great problems of humanity. It's been the great lie that has been propagated, particularly perhaps in the Western world, that it's about getting and spending and on to the next thing, and then the next, and so we accumulate. Remember that story that Jesus told about the rich man and his barns, and he looks at everything, he says, wow, you know, I've got everything. I need more, and I will bid bar, build new barns in order to fill my barns with all that I have. And, and so he builds all these barns, and then God says, you fool, you fool. You know, tonight your soul is required of you. He was going to go. He was going to go. And, and, and all this empire that he's built, 
it's such a foolish way forward. And so many of us do that. We build our lives on sand instead of the solid rock who is our living Lord Jesus Christ. I, believe me, it's so attractive, this other thing. It's so attractive. We're probably all into that to a greater or lesser extent. And we've just forgotten that we have a soul, that one day our soul will be required. But we don't want to think about that. We stick our head in the sand, pretend, pretend that it's all about this. And we remember, we forget those words that I've often shared with you as a kid. Somebody said, James, don't forget two things, the shortness of time. Remember this one? The shortness of time and the vastness of eternity. Now, why? Given that, and it's true our little four score years and ten or however long, how short it is and how vast that is. Man shall not live on bread alone. We will all stand, we will all bow before our God. One day, one day. And what will we hear? You know, well done. I know you, I know you. And we've been together and you have loved me and I have loved you. Well done. Well done. Enter into the joy of your Lord. But it's admit, it's easy to forget. It, it is really when you're on the treadmill, you know, and you need this, and you need that, and you need to upgrade, and you need to do this. And we, we get onto this treadmill, and we are losing the plot. We are losing the plot. And it's a temptation. But we don't see it like that. One of my heroes, do you remember Matthias Rust? Do you remember that name? Ring a bell, 28th of May, 1987. Young German guy gets up in a Cessna aircraft in Helsinki, Finland. And what does he do? He flies towards Moscow, the world's most sophisticated armed state with every rocket and you know, to counter the Americans when they attack, and all the NATO and other, other, other uh, missiles and nu nuclear. So what does Matthias Rust do? Remember, he gets into a Cessna. Cessna. This is not a MiG, at least a Phantom. This is a Cessna. And he's a teenager, and he flies low over Europe. Remember, there he comes, just above the trees. Where does he land? Red Square. Red Square, Moscow. You can go online and see the plane landing, you know. Russians are appalled. You know, they didn't expect that. They expected the biggies, you know. And we're, we're there, we're there. They did not expect a young German teenager to come flying over the trees and pew, down onto Red Square. And the Soviet generals are sacked and there's a huge crisis. And some say, you know, that was the beginning of the end for the Russians. Probably a little bit simplistic. But you can imagine the humiliation for Russia to be caught off guard. We just did not Expect it. And the little oak got in. And this is one of those sort of flying over temptations, flying low. We're in there for the biggies, you know, like, you know, the, we're going to be tempted to do this and that. No, no, no. Matthias Rust comes in and he lands. And he nails them. Nails them. I love that. <laughs> really, really do. So... There's the first one. Um, Matthias, um, turn the stones into, into bread. And then, and, then the, and then the second one is, is, is jump, jump. You, you want people to acknowledge you? Do, they want, do you want them to acknowledge you as the Lord? Why, why go this other route? 
that you've chosen for yourself. Why? When all you have to do, think about it, Jesus, all you have to do is jump. And he quotes the Bible, you see. Don't always believe somebody just because they quote the Bible. Yeah. He quotes the Bible. And if you jump, the battalions of heavenly angels will swoop before you strike your head on Mother Earth. And can you imagine the impact? Everybody will go, oh, isn't it amazing? So why do you have to go to the cross route when all, that's all you have to do? And what does Jesus say? Again, he's wrestling. He's wrestling. If you are the Son of God, I mean, I guess, well, we don't know. Uh, but don't put the Lord your God to the test. That scripture comes to him in his weakness. And it's so fundamental to who he is, that scripture. And he is going to live by that command. Do not. Put the Lord your God to the test, my... No, he didn't say my friend, but anyway. That's number two. When a path is not an easy path, and there are maybe other ways, but they involve significant compromises to who you are and your value system. Are we going to take shortcuts? Yeah, you know. Why? Well, so this is who I am. This is who I am. I'll come back to that. And then that last one about the nations of the world out there. There it is. Like, it'll all be yours. All be yours. If you bow down and worship me. Do you have your price as a Christian? As a follower of Jesus? Think. You know, is there, is there a, a line that you're willing to cross? Given that the price is right. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world? This is Jesus again. Remember that great moment of man for all seasons? Thomas Moore and Richie Rich. I think you're talking about the, the Chancellorship of Wales. And here's this guy who Thomas Moore thought was his friend. And Richie Rich is being turned by the rich and the powerful, being turned to, to betray Thomas Moore, and Moore looks to him and says, Sir Ritchie, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul for whales? You know. We got our limits, our values, and say, this is who I am, this is who I am, won't do it. Or are we prepared to trade our souls, trade who we are, trade our upbringings, our belief system for something which at the end of the day is worthless. So, those are three temptations, but just before I stop, just before I stop, I find it very significant that each temptation starts with, if you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. And you might say, well, of course he's the Son of God, but it's a big if. And that's the play. If you are the Son of God. And Jesus knew he was the Son of God. And yes, it was a huge factor. Satan wants him to kind of manipulate all that. Of course, I could, if I am the Son of God, I can do that. But Jesus' thinking is, I am the Son of God, therefore I won't do that. I won't do that. Now, there's a difference. If I'm the Son of God, I can do that. Or if I'm the Son of God, I won't do that. Do you, do you remember Les Miserables? You know, you've seen the play in London. You probably saw the movie. I always think the first cast that you... Uh, the second cast, or whatever cast they are now, they're all pretty good, but I love that first cast. And Jean Valjean, Jean Valjean, Colm Wilkerson, was just the best Jean Valjean. And, and, and you remember that song, Who Am I? Who Am I? It's just thrilling. So Jean Valjean, in his younger days, was a thief. He was a thief. And then he's shown mercy by a Catholic priest, 
And in that act of mercy, he knows he does not deserve. This priest kind of covers for him. And Jean Valjean's life changes dramatically. And from becoming a petty little despicable thief, he puts his life together and it builds and it builds and he becomes a businessman and, a, and, a, and an important businessman who really looks after his employees. But all along, there is this French policeman, Javert, Javert, who's a symbol of correctness, but, but he's just not a nice guy. Really nice guy. So there's this sort of conflict between Jean Valjean and Javert. And Javert knows that that guy who's so successful now is actually a thief. And he's determined to capture this guy and arrest him. And there is something that happens, and Jean, Javert is quite sure that Jean Valjean is behind it. So he goes off in search of Jean Valjean, and he arrests somebody who he thinks is Jean Valjean, who in fact is not Jean Valjean. And amidst great pomp and ceremony, a trial is to be held in Paris, at which Jean Valjean is to be tried for this crime. And it's not Jean Valjean. And Jean Valjean hears about this, and he goes to the courtroom. And he's sitting there, and he hears the dialogue, and he knows what's going to happen to that guy if he gets convicted. And he knows the story. I am Jean. That ain't Jean Valjean. And as this whole thing moves, and he sees where it's going, the temptation, what do I do here? Do I, do I just let this slide? Let that poor little son so, and I'm gone. Or what? Do I identify myself? And then there is that song, Who Am I? Who Am I? It's kind of emotional moment. Who am I? This is a make or break moment in my life. Who am I? And he can rationalize, I am the master of hundreds of servants. They all, you know, he's struggling, you know, why he should keep quiet and let that poor little son say. He can, all the justifications are there. And then there's that moment when he stands up, you know, who am I? I'm Jean Valjean, and so Javert, and he addresses Javert. I'm two, four, six, so, you remember that one? One, whatever, you know it. <laughs> Thrilling moment. Thrilling moment. But the question is, who am I? Who am I? You know, who am I? Am I going to do this? Am I going to allow this? Or am I going to deny everything that I've ever been taught, my upbringing, my faith, my God, my family, my own self? Or am I just going to go that way? What am I? Who am I? Who am I? If you are the Son of God, if you are, thinking that he could play this one. Of course I could do it. Could do it. Nobody, nobody will know. And Jesus says, if you are the Son of yeah, who am I? I am the Son of God. And therefore, there are certain ways of living that I'm going to hold to. This is who I am. And just, when you're in situations where it's a struggle, and it's a struggle, and it's very real, maybe getting sucked into a relationship that is not what ought to be, and or whatever, just ask yourself, who am I? Who am I? Am I going to be led by, the, by, by, the, by just instinct here, or is there another? Do I march to the sound of a different drum? Because I'm a child of God. I have been bought not with worthless things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus. Who am I? That's who I am child of God. I'm a son. I'm a son to parents who prayed for me and were wonderful Christian people. I'm, I'm a minister of a, a wonderful, incredible church. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? If you are the, if you are the son of God. So, here's your homework. Go home and read these. Matthew, 
4, Matthew 4, and read there, the temptations of Jesus. And just say, who am I? When you are in those situations. Uh, I found this thrilling. It's about Jesus, speaking Jesus. It's called speaking Jesus. This week, I just, it was a really, really significant moment for me in this week. Somebody sent it to me, and I watched this. And, and it was kind of quite, it touched me. It really, really, really touched me. It's a song. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Cause your name is power Your name is healing Your name is life Break every strong
the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within his presence I speak Jesus Lovely, lovely, lovely. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for for this extraordinary story from the Bible, which speaks to us right here, February 2020. And it's about you, Lord Jesus, and some of the struggles that you experienced. And we speak your name. We bring your name to our lips, for you are the Son of God. You are the helper, the strengthener. And if we have not yet known you and loved you and committed ourselves to you, we bow in our hearts this morning and invite you into our lives, asking you for forgiveness and cleansing and strength asking you that you will come in and take that deep place in our hearts. Just thank you for this hour together this morning. We pray for folk in our congregation who are not well. We think especially of Stefan Matusik and the accident that he's had. Please, Lord, be merciful as he undergoes the operations. And we pray that you will do something really wonderful in his hand that has been so, so badly damaged. For other folk, Lord, whom we know and love, and in these moments of quietness, we, we just name them. It is enough for us in your presence to, to name them. So let us do that now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers for our town, our nation, God, have mercy upon us. And bring us back to the right paths, the ancient paths. And we ask this in your name. Amen.